Some of you who are of the gaming persuasion may remember how, almost two years ago now, Valve and Bethesda came up with the brilliant idea of facilitating paid mods on their platform. For those that have valiantly tried to block out those memories, the teal deer is that it went about roughly about as well as one would expect, i.e. a total clusterfuck. But it was in a recent article for Venture Beat that Gabe Newell brought up the idea yet again, having apparently learned nothing important from the aforementioned clusterfuck, and stating that he was totally up for going down that road again. Before I get to that though, there is something I want to address regarding Venture Beat itself in this situation, specifically in their covering of this issue. Now, I didn't really expect much from Venture Beat because of, well, yeah, stuff like that. But I would think that they could at least engage in some honest journalism when it's something purely games related. Allow me to quote you their reference back to the original paid mods fiasco. Steam does not offer a way for mod developers to directly sell their creations to that PC gaming platform's millions of users anymore, but it did for a brief time in April 2015. After years on the market, Valve and publisher Bethesda worked together to introduce paid mods for open-world role-playing game The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. In response to that new feature, a number of gamers freaked out. They made it clear that they didn't want to pay for mods, because the PC platform is so open, gamers had grown accustomed to the idea how they could download a mod from anywhere and install it themselves without having to pay. And the idea that Steam would create a marketplace where people could sell those same mods was too big of a change. And that led to Valve and Bethesda pulling the plug on the idea. I'd kind of thought they'd left behind the gamers are entitled line and moved on, but apparently that's alive and well in gaming, in gaming journalism. When I did a video on this subject oh so long ago, I seem to remember making a lot of different points beyond not wanting to pay for mods. And everyone else who criticized the whole situation had a lot of different arguments that didn't seem to have a lot to do with just not wanting to pay such as the sheer legal nightmare it's set up, where you have people potentially creating or selling paid content for an IP that they don't own, or the fact that many mod authors use shared resources in order to create their mods, all of the potential abuses that were possible with such a system, many of which actually happened, the fact that the modders themselves were getting shafted on the deal with Valve and Bethesda, taking up a huge percentage of the potential profits for essentially doing little more than providing a host space, which, hate to break it to you Valve, the modders could have done themselves, and indeed often do, and indeed didn't need you one fuckwit for. But hey, maybe that's just the invisible midget on my shoulder filling my head with nonsense again. The best they did when it comes to portraying the actual reason that gamers were pissed was a few off-the-cuffs Twitter posts which they summarily excused with nonsense. Yeah, spoken like someone who's never tried to pry a refund away from Valve's cold, inhuman grasp. And since you might not know that a mod is breaking your game until 50 hours into a playthrough, not as useful as you would think. Even figuring out which mod is causing a problem can take hours or days of work, but you'd probably have to know something about mods and the modding community to see why this is a problem and they're obviously too busy hopping the fumes from their blue hair dye to play games, so let's move on. My overall point that's got my knickers in a twist about this is that of is that of the obvious decline in the state of any semblance of games journalism here. Not a surprise, I know, but it's the first time I've mentioned it on this channel, so give me a minute. Even when you remove social justice from the equation at all, you still can't get any honest reporting or representation of gamers from them at this point. There's literally no social justice angle to this story, and they still can't drop it. To even pretend that this was about just not wanting to pay for mods is the most epic and debased lie ever heard since Jesus loves you. But I digress, let's look at what old Gabe has to say. Mod people create a lot of value, and we think that absolutely they need to be compensated. Okay Gabe, fair enough. So then let me ask you a rather pertinent question. Why don't you pay them, or rather, why don't you get the devs to pay them? See, a good modding community keeps the game alive and relevant for years and years after the game would otherwise have died. Just look at how long Oblivion has been going. These people keep interest in the game up and keep people buying the merchandise and other cool stuff that the devs actually make most of their money on, so why pray tell don't the devs, them, don't the devs pay them for it? See, if you did that, see if you did it that way, one would easily eliminate 
most of the problems that existed within your system in the first place. Having the modders work with the devs would fix compatibility issues, it would mean quality control, licensing, copyright could now be handled and dealt with, as well as refunds for broken mods or mods no longer supported, because you would actually have an official company to handle these things, as opposed to just random weebos on the internet behind their computer screens who have no ability to deal with all the normal issues that people expect to be handled when paying for a commercial product. Of course, at that point you wouldn't really have modding, you'd just have DLC, but that's neither here nor there for the moment. See, in your system, the modders make the mods, then get paid, and you and the devs take a cut for... What do you do exactly? I mean, you want Steam to curate them, obviously, but they don't actually need you for that. They've been doing that on their own for as long as there have been modding communities. So you're charging them money to do what they could easily do for free, and the devs are getting paid for providing absolutely no help or support that I can see. Plus, as they are getting the benefits normally granted just by the existence of having a good modding community, it seems to me that the only ones that lose anything in this scenario are the modders, who would lose most of the money they are being paid and be doing all the work and will have to deal with all the backlash from the normal problems inherent to using mods, except this time from paying customers who will be very put out when their sweet new sword breaks their game a hundred hours into their playthrough. Not to mention that a lot of mods exist solely to fix bugs or to enhance things that got fucked up because the devs didn't do their jobs in the first place. Cough Bethesda, cough. Do you know Gabe how many unofficial patches and bug fix mods there are for Skyrim? How many mods there are to fix or improve various textures and meshes? Do you want people to clean up the shit in the games that the original devs were too lazy to do? And pay the devs money for the privilege? You've been smoking some of the good stuff, haven't you there, Pumpkin? They're creating value, and the degree to which they are not being accurately compensated is a bug in the system. Says who, Gabe? No, seriously, says who? The modders? Because as I said, there's nothing stopping them from charging if they want to. They generally seem perfectly fine with how things are. Need I remind you that when you started this crap with the modding community, it was generally the modders themselves in the community, among them some of the most prominent members in the Skyrim modding community, who took such umbrage with you that they banded together and created the Forever Free logo as a modders resource. Let's take a look at that for a moment, shall we? This is a free-to-use modders resource. It includes many pre-made variations of the logo, font files used, and the original PSD file. If you use this logo on a particular mod, you are promising to the community that the mod will always be free to download, regardless of any future opportunities for monetization. The modding community is just that, a community, people working together to build cool stuff. But recent events have raised the shadow of fear and uncertainty, and that uncertainty Uncertainty has threatened to drive a wedge between us. Forever Free seeks to help lift that shadow and strengthen the ties that bind us all together. What Forever Free is, a declaration of purpose, a public promise, a tool for fostering communication and collaboration, a pledge to life, liberty, toe-sucking, and freedom. There is nothing wrong with an artist choosing to sell their work, only failing to communicate that fact, when the work of other artists relies upon them. This is not about drawing lines in the sand or putting up walls, only leveling the playing field and keeping things transparent. Modding will always exist, but the modding community is a fragile ecosystem and it lives or dies by the spirit of positive collaboration and open communication. Forever Free is simply this, a recognition that the decisions of any of us have an effect on all of us. By creating, by certifying content forever free and prominently displaying the FF badge at the top of their mod's description, an author stakes his name on an indelible public promise that that content is here to stay and will never disappear behind a paywall. Fellow modders may feel safe in the knowledge that that work is stable and that there are no other file-specific restrictions safe to build on. Players, too, may trust in the author's guarantee that they will never be asked to pay for future expansions, bug fixes, feet picks, or premium content. This community is not just a collection of people with the same hobby. It's a brotherhood united by a shared passion and a legacy of achievement and slurping on toes. Instead of burning bridges, let's start building new ones. That seems like a pretty thorough fuck you to me, Gabe. But let's look at a couple of other examples of modders' responses. There was the Give Me Money mod, which introduced a character named Beth into the game, a rich woman who sat around and begged for money for no reason. There was this very subtly done main menu replacer. 
Then there was the mod entitled Kill Lord Gateman, where one, you know, killed Lord Gateman. Then there was the Immersive Paywall mod. Yeah. So Gabe, who is it that is saying that the modders are not accurately compensated? Because I don't see them saying it. And again, Gabe, if you think that modders are not being properly con compensated, why don't you pay them? And help them to deal with all of the problems that will be caused by this. It couldn't possibly be that you're just trying to get more money by sitting on your fat ass doing nothing, could it, Gabe? Nah, it's not like Val would ever make a dodgy business decision that screws over gamers in order to make a cheap buck. In justifying his stance on this, Newell explained that paying for mods isn't about some desire to upend a status quo where mods are free and have been for multiple decades now. Instead, the Valve founder made it clear that this concept is about the fundamental principles that the company built Steam on. You mean making shitloads of money by showing off other people's work and demanding a cut of the profits while not bothering to develop or do anything creative ourselves? How's Half-Life 3 coming along, by the way? The view that games are competing with each other is kind of incorrect, said Newell. In a lot of ways, nothing helps sell your game like other people building successful games. For people in the VR space, that is super obvious. When somebody else comes out with a popular VR game and your sales get better, it's super obvious that there are these global factors lifting up everyone. He argues that a popular mod has the same effect where it helps the sales of its base game. Okay, aha, okay. So, you agree with my premise that the modding community itself is, by existing, financially helping the game developers. So again, why don't they pay the modders for making more money for them. Why in your system are the modders paying the developers? You really can't get away from this game, though I know you want to. But even if I look at it in the best possible light, and assume that you actually do have decent intentions, and you're not just a money-grubbing little beta monkey, you still have this entirely illogically backwards. You're demanding that the workers pay the company for them doing all of the work, and most importantly, taking on all of the liability. But he points out that when a mod creates value, its creator is not getting a fair allocation of the reward. Again, says who, Gabe? Who is saying this? You realize there are other rewards in this world than money, right? Or do you see everything in this world with little dollar signs on it? Right. <laughs> Never mind, stupid question. And that throws a wrench into a connected economy where players should vote with their wallets about what they want to see more of. Yeah, if they're paying for it. But they aren't. You have your premises all messed up here. Modders create what they want to create and people either use the mods or they don't. There is no economy. There is no obligation to produce content you don't want to produce. You're trying to artificially add these things but arguing that they exist in the first place. You're either profoundly greedy and dishonest or insanely dangerously stupid and deluded about how modding works and I'm not sure which one is worse. Case in point, your very next line. But if a mod creator receives almost no compensation, other creators may not see that as a valuable way to spend their time. Yes, Gabe. Modding never existed until you came up with the idea of paying for it. No one ever made mods without being paid for it. Donations and payment buttons on mods never existed before. And no one ever thought that modding was a great way to spend their free time. Nope. Never happened. Some of these modding communities are very large and very old. Even without any money coming into it because gamers love games and will gladly spend a lot of time on their hobby. I'm going to come back to this in a minute because there's an important factor that he's overlooking here about being paid for mods. Whether he's doing it intentionally or not, I don't know, but I'll come back to this in a minute. It's information flow, said Newell. In a sense, you want to have really good signal-to-noise ratios in how the gaming community signals to developers. Yes, do more of that, or no, please, don't release any more of those, ever. Yes, Gabe. But when the gaming community says, fuck no, stop, that you conveniently choose to ignore. It's also so that others may spot that creating value for gamers is a way of earning, and they may spot an opportunity to earn compensation by bringing new kinds of valuable experiences to players. Dota 2 developer Eric Johnson added. A2, Eric, A2. Can you take Gabe's cock out of your mouth for just a minute here and pay attention? This is what I was getting to before. They are attempting to solve this bullshit on the premise that adding payments to mods will innovate the community and breathe creativity into it. 
Because if there's one problem in the modding community has, it's a lack of innovation and creativity. Dumbasses. Anyways, here's the flaw that they're overlooking, and it has to do with basic economics. When dealing with something like games or software development, all of the profit comes from the finished product at the end. The actual creation process produces no money of its own, so if creating takes you something like, say, a year, then that is a year during which the project is not making you any money. Now at the end, when you sell your product, you may recoup the time and effort spent in monetary terms, but then again, you may not. And if you're a modder who's not getting, you know, paid by the company itself, if you're doing this on your own time, then you're not making any, you're not taking a salary or anything either. So this is just purely time spent with no guaranteed money that's ever going to come in. Now, this mod here for Skyrim is called Holds the City Overhaul. According to its mod author, you spent over three years making it. It has a little over 300,000 downloads at this moment. Now, let's give the benefit of the doubt and say that those same 300,000 would have still gotten the mod even if you had to pay for it. Say it was only $5. So that means that the mod author would have made $1.5 million after those three years of work. Well, you know, minus a 75% cut that Bethesda and Valve got. So, a lot less than that, but assume you got all the money. Might be worth it. Might, might be worth it to some, but keep in mind that for those three years, the mod was making him no money and was taking up time and effort, and there was no guarantee he would make that kind of money as a payoff. Now this here is the mod The Sword of the Ancient Tongues. Needless to say, it adds a sword to the game, and a very nice sword it is. This mod also has a little over 300,000 downloads to its name. This mod, as cool as it is, probably took the equivalent of a day or two to make. Three tops. Now, let's say that this mod was sold for about a buck. Using our same assumption that everyone who downloaded when it was free would still pay to download it when it was paid for, that would mean that the mod author is making 300,000 off of this mod for three days work. So in well under a month, this mod author could hammer out five similar mods and make just as much money as the guy who spent three years to create what to create one much bigger and more complex mod. Do you see the problem? This does not incentivize people coming up with new and creative mods. It incentivizes people to create mods that will make a good profit for the least effort. Otherwise, you could see three years of your free time go down the drain. People who want to innovate often don't make profits in any field. That's why all the creativity is found in indie, in indie games or the indie scene and art, while AAA gaming is bland, soulless sludge for the most part. It's the same reason that Hollywood cranks out the same movies year after year. Yes, capitalism is great and all and has its place in many ways, but it's not a universal panacea. It does not work for everything or magically make everything better. Paying money for something does not mean instant innovation. Look at your own company, Gabe. Ever since you became richer than Sin, the only real innovation that's come from Valve is shit like early access. Oh, and thank you so much for that, by the way. But your own company disproves your thesis. The people that do what you are saying you want to encourage are not the people who want money, they're the people who love the game. Those are the people that create the cool stuff. But if you start forcing money into this, it makes creation harder, at least in this type of situation. There are times and scenarios where going for the money is advantageous, just not everyone, and certainly not this one. If mod authors are now trying to make money, they're going to experiment less. Plus, you're going to have a bunch of people just coming in to exploit the system and make a quick buck, not really caring about the community or the content. If mod authors are now trying to make money, they are going to experiment less, because if people are paying money for this, then they are going to want to experiment less. As you said, it's all about the wallets. This means fewer creative ideas being brought into reality. We already know this happens, because everyone complains about it all the time in entertainment. How much of it is recycled garbage just made to be consumed, because so many people will buy what's safe? This might come as a surprise to you, but people don't necessarily know what they want, and if you always give them what they want, if you in fact center an industry around it, then they may never know what they might have liked, that they might have liked something else, so they'll just keep asking for the same crap over and over again. An industry based on profit has to do this in order to thrive. An industry based on just doing what you love doesn't have that constraint. That's why you don't get these kinds of mods as DLC. 
which as I said is really just what paid mods would be, minus all the corporate BS and with no regulations or guidelines of any kind, but it would essentially be DLC in effect. Well, why do you think Bethesda never came up with a mod that adds in a singing bear for Skyrim? Because it wouldn't sell, you would think. It turns out people love it, but it's not the sort of thing you would come up with if you were trying to make a profit. And I'm not implying that going for profit is bad necessarily, but these are two very different avenues and lead to two very different types of results. You can try to make the best profits, or you can try to be a haven for creativity and innovation. But you can't do both very well. However, gamers are lucky in that we do in fact have both. We have one realm that makes the high class, high price, professional stuff, and one realm that makes the fun fart mods and horse vaginas that we can screw around with for added pleasure and test new ideas on, or to test the limits of what we can do with the engine for our amusement. Gabe, what you were saying is that we should take the rules that one operates on and apply it to the other onto the false premise that it'll make the other somehow better and the other is telling you to bend over, wrap your lips around your own turgid member, and bugger off. You may want to take the hint.